today, I just want to remind you the purpose of Traders Talk. It's to give you the truth of trading by interviewing top traders who trade for real and give you different ways to trade the markets for consistent performance. Today's speaker, we are very um, happy to have Joseph Clement on Traders Talk today. Joseph Clement is a research analyst and former chief investment officer with 20 years experience in the financial markets. He spent most of his career working with wealthy individuals and family offices advising them on investments and helping them manage their portfolios. Josim studied mathematics and physics at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland, and graduated with a master's degree in mathematics. During this time at ETH, Josim experienced the technology bubble of the late 1990s firsthand. Through this work, he became interested in finance and investments and studied business administration at the universities of Zurich and Hagen, Germany graduating from master's degree in economics and finance and switching into the financial services industry in time for the run-up to the financial crisis. The lessons he has learned through his career have been brought together in his new book, Seven Mistakes Every Investor Makes and How to Avoid Them. Josim, it's a great pleasure to have you today on uh, Traders Talk. A welcome on board. The big yes. chests. Uh -huh. Good. Good to hear your voice. How are you today? Excellent. And <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining this webcast. I actually feel quite privileged because uh, probably unlike most of your guests that you have, my focus throughout my career wasn't really in trading only, but a lot in investing. And I actually started my career as a long-term investor uh, who basically got into trading for interests on his own. I love to trade a little bit on the side myself and through clients, uh, having worked with family offices and uh, private clients throughout my, most of my career, they obviously like to trade as well. And so I, I help them with their trading approaches as well. Okay, good. Um, yeah, just um, just a little bit about you, Josim. I, I think just to start it all off, we just want to know a little bit about your background. So, how old were you when, when you first started? I mean, what, was there some or particular person, was there an event or particular person that triggered your interest in the investments? And do you do uh, other things as well? Yes. So my start, I got my start when I was at uni, uh, studying maths and physics. But on the side, I was getting more and more involved in a little spin-off uh, of my university, which was an internet job exchange board. So a, a company that through the internet offered jobs to different candidates. Now, today that sounds totally boring and uh, something that we know from companies like Indeed and Monster and you name it. Um, but that was the early 90s and the internet actually was just a few years old. So it was kind of cutting edge stuff that we did back then. And that got me uh, into the kind of the tech world and get in, uh, involved in the tech world. And as part of that, I also started to dabble with the first few savings that I had as a student in tech stocks. Uh, did really well for the first couple of years. And then eventually, uh, of course, what happened, we all know the story, tech bubble burst. And uh, let's put it this way. Uh, in the end, I sold most of my stocks with about 80% loss. And that's what I call school fees. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so it was basically your university days that really triggered your interest and got you into tech stocks. A any particular reason why you got into tech stocks? Because of the work in a small tech company and, uh, you know, it's the classic thing. If you work in the tech industry, even if it's just like an aside thing with a company run by students and PhD students and former students, um, you start to get interested in the industry. You get to know more people in the industry and you start to get a feel for what is going on and you start to think, oh, I know what's going on. So maybe I should use my money to make some money on the side with investments in some tech stocks. It's always interesting, Josim. I, I actually start off with asking this question with um, every trader who comes to Traders Talk, and we actually always um, wonder on the. Um, it's actually interesting how actually all the dots connect together, as Steve Jobs says. Actually, when you're doing it, you don't really see how it's going to connect in, in the future. But when you look back, it's actually marvelous to see how all the dots connect together, and there was an intelligent orchestration, was it not? 
No, absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Um, the situation is that, yes, it sounds terrible when I say, okay, my first experiences as a trader ended in a pretty much 80% loss mm. uh, after the tech bubble burst. But these losses, I think I've made up for them more than 10 times by now, simply because of the fact that First of all, when I was a student, I didn't have much money. Well, I don't have much money either at the moment, but that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I lost in pure dollar terms, or in that case, because I was in Switzerland, Swiss franc terms, not that much money. And the lessons I learned about how to invest and uh, how to not lose 80% going forward, they have uh, served me extremely well throughout my career and has, have basically put me on, a, on another level already uh, in, in terms of how to manage my investments. Yeah, very good. Um, just a little bit before we go into the deeper questions, what is your main style of investment are you like a value investor growth investor or i have two portfolios if you will um there's one portfolio which is my long-term portfolio for retirement savings etc and there i simply buy index funds and etfs and buy and hold them for the long run and then when it comes to my trading portfolio which is the second portfolio uh i basically have started my life as somebody who was mostly driven by value and quality. Um, however, uh, I've made bad experiences with that as well and have shifted more and more over time to become somebody who is driven by two things, mostly price momentum and then future growth. Uh, so I've, I've transitioned from starting as a value investor 20 years ago to becoming more of a growth investor today. Um, my trading portfolio today is practically all of it. Actually, now at all of the stocks that I have in my trading portfolio are biotech stocks at this point in time. But it can be IT, communication services. Sometimes there are even high growth industrial companies in there if I find something interesting. Yeah, good. So this is interesting. You, you started off as a value and you became a, a momentum and a growth investor. I must say, audience, you know, one of the... Um, real good things that really got me interested to interview Joseph today for his book was that how he actually uses a bit of trading concepts in his investment choices too. Now, before we get more into that on how you manage your, your trades and your investments, I just would like to know based on um, the portfolio that you're having at the moment, which is you said it's, it's more on biotech and, 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 and the tech um, stuff, is there is that like a concept to all your investment choices that you take? Yes, uh, and it comes from actually my work. I write a blog, as you may know, um, and as part of that blog, I have to I, I like to read and read a lot of stuff in all kinds of areas. And with my science background, I also like to read a lot about scientific developments. So uh, I, I tend to kind of get interested in specific new technologies or new science and research results. And that triggers some uh, uh, interest in particular stocks if it's already investable. To give you a concrete example, about 2016, 2017, I started reading a book on uh, uh, gene editing, uh, something that I don't know if uh, a lot of people are familiar with that in, on, on this trader's talk, uh, but uh, CRISPR technology that is a technology that allows to edit genes very targeted and very at very low costs. And so as part of that, uh, the interesting thing is that the scientists who developed that, all four of them launched four NASDAQ listed biotech companies that got backing from major pharmaceutical companies like uh, Novartis and Sanofi, etc. And so I got interested in those and they just ended up in my trading portfolio and have stayed there for several years and uh, uh, did really well with them. Okay, good. Um, so on the biotech front, I mean, a little bit more on the entry, like, is there like a typical entry that would look like for one of your inv investments? Like, for example, like, would you look on some charts? Would you look at some momentum? How would you define momentum? What would the entry look like? Do you, and I remember reading in your book, like you do look at trailing um, P&E uh, versus forward P&E, which I found really very, very interesting. So like mm -hmm. that, what are your parameters for 
entering into your trades or your investments? Yes. So there are basically three main variables that I like to look at. Uh, the first one is uh, momentum. And there I look at absolute as well as relative momentum over the last 12 months. So I, I look at the absolute performance of a stock over the last 12 months. I typically subtract the last month's return uh, because there are these short-term reversal effects that uh, we often fall prey of. So, I, so in order to kind of not falling prey to short-term reversals, I look at last 12 months return minus last month's return, which gives me a good idea of the kind of medium term momentum of the stock. There, what I would like to see or what I have to absolutely see is positive price momentum over the last 12 months. And ideally, not just positive, barely positive, but relatively high positive momentum so that it's kind of a really good solid price momentum. Once that is satisfied, I look at PE ratios and return on assets or return on equity. So profitability and valuation. And there, in both of these variables, I always insist never look at forward uh, PE ratios or forward return on assets or forward return on equity. Every broker in the world will tell you about how great forward PE ratios look. But the problem with forward uh, ratios is that they depend on analyst estimates for future earnings. And we all know that analysts are on average chronically over optimistic. They expect too much growth on average for the next 12 months or, or even the next six months. And as a result, a lot of companies, particularly high growth companies that have extremely uh, optimistic assumptions underneath, they look extremely cheap if you divide the current share price by inflated or overly optimistic future earnings. So instead of doing that, I go for past earnings. So I look at price divided by trailing earnings over the last 12 months. That has some different problems because the problem, of course, is that you assume implicitly that what happened over the last 12 months will, be, will happen again in the next 12 months. And, well, we've seen over the last three months with the COVID crisis that an awful lot of things can change very, very quickly. However, in most instances, uh, I actually can show that uh, if you do that consistently and just use trailing P.E. ratios instead of forward P.E. ratios, uh, what you get is a significant outperformance versus using forward P.E. ratios, simply because if you go and do this for year after year after year, most of the time analyst expectations are too optimistic and will distort your, your valuation metrics, just like your profitability metrics. So I rely on trailing metrics. Of course, I don't do it blindly. Um, what I typically do is I look at trailing PE and trailing return on assets, so profitability and, and valuation. And then I basically rank uh, both of these metrics with the, the stock within its index. So if it's a British stock, I rank it within the FTSE 100 or the FTSE 250 if it's a smaller cap and give it a rank from best to worst. And then I add these two ranks together and I get kind of an average rank or a total rank based on valuation and profitability. And what I like to see is that this stock that I'm looking at is in the top third of its index in terms of valuation and profitability. Because then I know I've got a stock that I know has positive medium term price, uh, price momentum and is relatively attractive and profitable compared to other, uh, other stocks in the index. And that gives me a good starting point to go into the stock and then uh, uh, stay with it until I see signals that something has changed dramatically, which is, of course, why you don't follow PE ratios and, and other uh, valuation metrics blindly. Very, very good um, detailed answer there, Josim. I must say in chapter one, page 30 is where I read your trailing PE ratio. And I found it very fascinating, found that really very justified too with all the uh, research that you backed it up. I'm sure for the attendees who are listening in later on, I, I believe that um, you can show this on the screens as well, Josim, like a little bit on yeah. how you would, yeah, so that'd be great. So we'll do that in the later part. Um, just a few more quick questions on entry. Uh, just wanted to check, I mean, do you scale into trades? Like, do you put 
more into um, the stock or the investment of the trade as it shows favorable more momentum? No, I okay. have a strict discipline of equal weight. So I, I have a budget for each stock. Um, so typically when I have a portfolio that is my trading portfolio and let's say I have 10,000 or 50,000 in there, let's pick an even number, 10,000. Uh, typically I have around four to six or seven stocks only in the trading portfolio. So it's very focused. Nice. Uh, and then I just put an equal amount, equal budget into each of these stocks. Uh, but I don't rebalance either with the trading. Uh, so I let them run. And if a stock kind of triples in price, then out of those 2,000, I've gained 6,000. So then it's just much bigger than the other positions, maybe. Interesting. Now, the final thing on entry uh, questions is that I just wanted to know, what is your best trade to date so far? And um, what was your thinking behind your entry? Now, let me just um, clarify on this definition. The definition of best, best trade to date um, can vary from trader to trader. Maybe you could define what is your best trade first, because I remember when we interviewed David Paul on this trader's talk, uh, he said that um, best trade for him not necessarily is the most profitable trade. Uh, for him was the one that taught him the best important lessons you know, for the future. So in that sense, uh, firstly, what would your definition be for a best trade to date so far? And then what would that best trade be and what was your thinking behind your entry? Mm -hmm. um, so I would, if I may, give you two answers. Uh, in terms of best trade defined as most successful trade, where I think my propensity to read uh, strange stuff that is not necessarily related to financial markets directly uh, is, is something that can help you uh, find little pearls and little gems in stock markets that other investors might not be able to find. And uh, one classic example was in 2003, um, when uh, the Iraq war started uh, in, uh, in Iraq. The US invaded Iraq, uh, stock markets basically came out of the 2001, 2002 bear market, started to rally. And after a while, uh, I thought to myself, okay, so we've clearly uh, beaten Iraq and now comes the rebuilding effort. And uh, so what I thought was, well, if one thing that Iraq has that a lot of people underestimate is it has a pretty highly educated elite. Uh, and they actually have money because of the oil exports. So they will be able to uh, buy into modern telecom infrastructure. And uh, so what I looked up was um, whether there are any licenses to be had for mobile telecom uh, companies that might have a license in Iraq. And uh, actually there was one, there was an Egyptian listed company, which has a name that I can't remember at this point in time, but they're basically, they're still around. Uh, and uh, I basically bought that stock because I thought together with Vodafone, they're probably the most likely winners from an expansion in Iraq. And Vodafone is such a big company that you know, if they, if they grow a lot in Iraq, nobody cares because their business is mostly in Europe. Uh, and, and in other uh, developed markets. So I bought that little Egyptian stock and uh, to be honest, it tripled in price within six months. Uh, wow. And uh, so that was, that was quite fortunate and, and a kind of an example of how reading exotic stuff that isn't related to the market and thinking about that, what does it mean for markets can help you find interesting stocks. The second part of the answer is stocks, I would say, best trades that teach you a lesson. Um, and in that respect, I consistently uh, refer to uh, my biotech stocks. Uh, I'll show you later on Gilead, uh, Gilead, which I still have in my portfolio, is one of the few stocks that I have at the moment. But there I constantly learn the lesson how important it is to limit your downside because obviously a lot of these tech stocks, biotech stocks, they're super volatile and they can do, can, can have massive, massive swings. And uh, so there, what I do is uh, I really have learned with Basilea Pharmaceutical, which is a Swiss biotech company uh, that I traded a lot in the 2000s. 
to limit my losses in order to live another day. It's kind of where I first learned and applied the lessons for, uh, from the mistake I made with my technology investments very early on, where I let the losses run until I was down 80%. With Basilea Pharmaceutical, which for a long time, just like Actelion, another Swiss pharm a biotech company, they were basically one product companies. They had one product in the pipeline. And if the, if the clinical trials failed, it, the stock was worthless. And if, it, uh, if the clinical trials were successful, the stock would double in price. So uh, I, I used a lot of stop loss and re-entry techniques to manage my risk uh, while not giving up on the stock and uh, giving up on its long-term outperformance. And I'll show you in a later stage with, with the screen on, on Gilead how I do that in practice. Very interesting. And I think um, that's the thing that really made me fascinate about um, how you wrote the book and, um, and why I wanted to interview you because you used the combination of uh, the losses and stop losses and limiting them as well. And then also maximizing on your returns, which I haven't really seen most of the investors talk about, which actually leads to the second part on stop loss. Um, because most value or growth investors, Joseph, as, as we have spoken before, it, they do not talk about stop losses. They are more conventional in the whole buy and hold mindset, you know, for many years and just le leave it to run. So can you explain to us a little bit more about your stops? Like when do you use them? Where do you place mm -hmm. them usually? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I think that is one thing where uh, I would say long-term investors, they, they typically poo-poo on trading techniques like stop losses because they say, oh, that's for the short-term investors and doesn't matter to us. But if you think about it, uh, if you are a long-term investor and your investments go down by 50%, well, they have to double in order to just get you to break even again. And uh, if you can instead avoid that 50% drawdown and limit it to maybe 20%, uh, it will take you much less time to get to break even. And then as a result, over the long run, you will start to make more money simply because you're out of that hole quicker and back into profit zone quicker. And that is something that every trader knows. Every trader knows you have to put in stop losses so you can survive for another day. Um, and, and I don't understand why long-term investors are so shy about these techniques because they can really improve your long-term performance if done right. So what I've done is I've, I've thought a little bit about stop losses. I've, I've tried different things, looking at moving averages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but my, my constant problem was if I am a long-term investor, I don't just want to be stopped out of a stock and then move on. Uh, I want to actually also be able to capture the long-term performance of that stock, which means that once I'm stopped out, I have to also define a rule how to get back in. And so what I did a little bit was to experiment with different stop loss levels, et cetera. And I came up with a rule of thumb that I look at the uh, volatility of a stock and I place a stop loss at roughly half, a volat half an annual volatility. So if a stock has, typical stock has 20% volatility per year. So I typically place a stop loss at around 10% below my entry price and I adjust the stop loss every year or every quarter, depending on how volatile the stock is and, and how, it, how it moves. If it has moved up significantly, I adjust obviously the stop loss up. Uh, but again, I typically put it 10% out of the money. Okay, so it's 50% of the annual volatility. So if the stock has got 30% and it's 15%, is that right? Correct, absolutely. And if you have a super volatile stock with 40% with volatility, it would be 20. And if you, have your, if you have something for your grandma, like a food company, uh, it would probably be more like 7 or 8%. Okay. Was there any reason for the 50% thing? Or why wouldn't you have placed it at 20% at itself, which is what it's showing, or the average? Why didn't you take an average volatility over 5 years, 10 years, whatever like that? Because what happens is the further out you post it uh, or put your stop loss, the, the less frequently it actually triggered. And uh, my challenge was triggering it soon enough so that my drawdown isn't too high and I have a Good. decent chance of getting out of my hole pretty quickly again. 
but at the same time, not putting the stop loss too close to the current price that it triggers like every week or every month. And, and I just have a lot of whipsaws. So what I found was that that half standard deviation is kind of the best trade off for the kind of investment horizons that I look at where I don't look at my stocks every day, but maybe two times a week or once or twice a week. Yeah. Thing. Very good. Um, so I guess you trail your stops as well. Just so every year you would then look at the annual volatility and trail the stops like that, or do you have a different mechanism for trailing stops? No, I, I typically uh, look at uh, my portfolio uh, once a year and adjust the trailing stops on an annual basis based on last 12 month volatility. Got you. Uh, and your risk management? Uh, is it like, how do you do your risk management? Is it like 10% of your portfolio you, you assign to one stock? How, how does that work? Uh, so as I said, it's equal weight. So if I have my trading portfolio, I typically have, as I said, between four and seven stocks in there and uh, they have an equal weight. So it's about 20% of my trading portfolio goes into each stock. Um, but then again, I also have to say my trading portfolio isn't 100% of all my savings. So in terms of my total savings, I would say those 20% limits is about 5% max of my total savings. And what happens if you want to add one more stock into it, then how would you then allocate in that sense? Yeah, well, so I... I so if I have 10,000 uh, in my trading portfolio and I have five stocks already, then usually what I do is if I find a sixth stock, which is rare, I just add 2,000 for my, for my savings. And got, and you, got, you, got you, got you, got you, got you, got you. All right, good. Um, I guess we covered this one, trade. The last one, yeah, before we go on to the screens, um, in terms of target, yes, where you exit, do you have like a predefined exit for all your trades or... Do you exit live when certain parameters are fulfilled or do you exit uh, based on discretion? So which I, one I, uh, I, either the stop loss triggers or discretion because I need the money for something else. <laughs> okay. 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 But, but that is, I mean, in terms of, of when to take profits is either when I think that there is no case anymore. And this, this stock has run its course, which to be honest, has almost never happened because I think if you have a really good growth case, then it can last for years, if not decades. Um, and most of the time taking profits and exiting it has been triggered by, by more external things uh, where I needed the money to pay the down payment for my house, for example, uh, and, and things like that. Yeah, okay. So you're saying it's basically a tr trading stop exit then. So there's no like predefined like at, when it hits maybe $100, $1,000. No. Okay. No, I don't believe in target prices. Uh, I, I am a research analyst. I know how the sausage is made and I know how these target prices are developed by brokerage analysts and I know that they are unreliable. Okay, okay. Good. Interesting to see that. Um, Okay, so I guess it's just stop loss and a stop loss. You already said that. Do you you don't scale out as well? I presume from what we've spoken. No. Right. Okay. And my final thing to cover this section is that I think this this question actually was inspired by me reading on new market visits. Um, one of the traders interviewed by Jack Schwager, he said one of the litmus tests that he usually has for when he's comfortable with the trading style that he trades on or investments that he chooses is the question of, do you feel at peace when you exit most of your trades or do you regret sometimes for coming out early or late from your trades? I would say I almost always have regrets when I come out of a trade. Uh, if it's a profitable trade, it usually, as I said, I, I have to exit it because I need the money for something else. And then if I come back a, a couple of weeks or months later and I see the shares gone up even more, uh, then, well, uh, some four-letter words will be, will be thrown at the, at the monitor. Um, but uh, that's, that's life. I mean, that's part of, of trading is to kind of have your emotions under control and live with the fact that you will never get it perfectly right. Um, as long as you, on average, make money with it, you're actually quite good. Okay, yeah. Uh, so in terms of that, I mean, you did say that most of the time you regret, but that's because also life situations which you cannot control. Um, yes. Do you sometimes then 
look to how, okay, let's say if we were to put a constant parameter here, which is, mm. let's say we take out all those external life scenarios and all that, but the ones where all the life scenarios were kept constant and all that, on those traits, were you at peace when you exited them? Uh, yes, and that's part of my stop loss strategy. Uh, it is designed also to minimize that regret. Uh, because as I mentioned before in this, in this traders talk, um, when I have a stop loss, I also have a re-entry strategy. So I always, when I get stopped out, know under which condition I will buy that stock again. And that is actually something where I look at uh, the price relative to its last three months low. And if the stock has climbed from its last three months low by more than a quarter st uh, vol annual volatility, I buy that share again. Uh, what that does to me is the following. The stop loss rule that we just discussed, half a volatility uh, and then I get stopped out, helps me prevent excessive losses. But once the bottom is found and the momentum turns positive again, I obviously don't want to wait forever until I get back into the stock and maybe lose a lot of the recovery. So I've, I've triggered or I've, I've designed a re-entry signal that is faster than the stop loss signal in the sense that it looks at the last three month return. And if you say you have a stock with 20% annual volatility, I got stop, uh, stopped out at 10% loss. And then it maybe goes down a little bit further and then it starts to rally again. And at some point it is up 5% from its low. That's when I buy into that stock again. And that's when I, when I try to capture the recovery and, and go back into the stock and capture the long-term momentum of the stock and the long-term growth of the stock. And I have designed that rule explicitly to avoid having to feel regret that I got stopped out and, Worst case scenario, the next day it started the rally of a decade, you know. Uh, and in order to prevent that regret, I've got these re-entry rules. And that's why whenever I get stopped out, I'm really at peace because I know if it gets worse, I'm out of the stock, I'm out of that market. Uh, but if it comes back, I'm pretty quickly back in and can benefit from the recovery. Brilliant. You know what? I, I must uh, say uh, that the re-entry rules and the stop loss rules were really one of the best parts of the um, book. And it's really good to see how you were approaching the market in a very different way than to most conventional investors, uh, where they would see almost their whole investment just drop. I mean, especially, you know, in February this year on the Dow, we had a, a 10, 11,000 point drop. And that would have carried a lot of stocks along with it as well, because it's, it's weighted on, on the 30 biggest stocks of US. So all these stop loss and re-entry rules that you talked about in the book, seven mistakes that every investor makes was really very beneficial, I, I must say. Just a quick question on that um, is that, how many of those trades where you re-entered, they stop you out again and do you re-enter them? Yes. Uh, the, the worst thing that can happen to my trading strategy is, and so many traders know that with their strategies, if a stock goes sideways, if a volatile sideways movement, you get stopped out, you come back in, you get stopped out, you come back in, you, come ba you get stopped out again and again and again. And that will drive you mad. Yeah. But in all my research and all my experience, I've never found a system or a rule that avoids that kind of stuff. If you if you design a trading system that does well in these kind of volatile sideways markets, you typically lose out either if you have in any directional market. And if you design a trading system for a directional market, you will have to live with these kind of sideways movements where sometimes you just kind of feel like this is all going back and forth in circles all the time. But the good thing is stocks, like so many other asset classes, trade most of the time, uh, trend most of the time. So the, the sideways markets is not what you should optimize your trading system for. So in, in your case, if you get such a thing where you re-entered and you did get stopped out, then do you stop re-entering or how, how is it that you have nope. designed it? Nope. No, I do it five times over if need be. Five times uh, over. I can, okay, show you the, I can show you the signals for, for Gilead in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a minute when we look at the screen. That'd be great. Um, the last part is on the psychology side, because we talked about, you know, um, regret and being at peace and everything. Do, do you have like any like practice that you do like before you start investment choices so as to make sure that the mind, you know, is not 
um, influenced by the past history of trades losing and all that so that the mind is always in the present moment focused on your plan for consistent execution do you do any practices uh, yes i do but it isn't necessarily because of my trading uh, uh, exercises etc but i have learned that i do much better both in my day job as a research analyst, analyzing companies and analyzing stock markets mostly, as well as an, in my role as an investor. In the past, I managed equity portfolios and multi-asset portfolios. And what I learned is that it's important to not get stressed out and to keep your emotions under control and keep your, your stress levels low, because that actually is, as you rightfully say to your, uh, a key component to avoiding making mistakes. And what I do is I've got a few kind of tips and uh, techniques that I use. So number one, I don't wear a watch. Uh, that is just a very, very personal observation that if I wear a watch, I constantly look at it what time it is. And that alone puts me a little bit under pressure as I see the time go by. Ever since I don't wear a watch anymore, and that's been 15 years or so, uh, I'm much more relaxed in meetings. I'm much more relaxed in front of my monitor when I look at my portfolio and when I trade because I'm under feel under less time pressure to do something. The second thing I tend to do when things get really, really crazy, like in the current uh, coronavirus crisis and everything is super stressful, I tend to uh, use... Um, progressive muscle relaxation, which is a, a simple relaxation technique where you tense up all your body muscles one by one and then relax them again. Uh, and that is kind of like a mini relaxation technique similar to meditation or mindfulness uh, that you can do either in the office 10 minutes or you can do it at home before you go to sleep. And then something that I don't do anymore, but I used to do quite a bit in the past was what I call the gadget-free Sunday where every Sunday I basically said no internet, no email, no phone, no TV, nothing of that sort. Just shut everything down and take that day off of any electronics and information. And you would not believe it's like a mini vacation. In the beginning, I was afraid I might get bored, but you don't get bored at all. It actually is something that helps you recharge your batteries. And then on Monday, you can go back to the markets and, and have far more energy. Listen, that was really nice that you really shared that. I, uh, that's very interesting, very different as well. Don't wear a watch. Um, I remember that. <laughs> and progressive muscle relaxation, yes. Um, most of the people that I know um, do do that. And Gadget Free Sunday, that's so, so, so good. Um, even me, myself, when I go on uh, retreats and all that, and when we put all the digital stuff away, I mean, so much of energy conservation happens so much of you know relaxation happens just by doing that because these things if we realize it or not i mean yes i mean they are good technology is good but just getting a break from them i mean just you know relaxes you and re-energizes you so much that you don't even are aware of when you're using them so that's really good um joseph that you actually shared that so I think the last part, I think let's go on screens, right? I think that'd be great for the uh, audience to see and then see how mm -hmm. you enter your um, investments and all that. So I'll stop this share and let's see now. So I just need to allow you to share too. So there you go. Uh, yeah, see. I think that okay. should allow you to share your screen now. Yes, let's see if that works. I guess you can see my screen now. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Then let me just quickly go into my office computer. Luckily, you cannot see my passport, which I just mistyped. Oh, that's good. <laughs> there we are. Can you see my Bloomberg screen here? Yes, yes, yes. Um, if Excellent. everybody else can see it as well, if you're typing yes into the chat box, that'd be great. So that we all know that you guys can see. Yeah, yeah, I can see all the yeses coming. Through. That's fine. Let's go. So what I've got here is a scenario analysis or trading monitor on Bloomberg. Uh, that is the one of the key benefits of my day job as a research analyst and strategist that I actually have access to Bloomberg, um, which is, I know, super expensive if you want to do it yourself. 
Um, but in any case, so I've got here Gilead, the US biotech company. Uh, I've bought it about two years ago. I'm not quite sure when exactly because I didn't look into my investment diary, which is something that we maybe want to touch on later as well, when exactly I bought it. But I remember sometime in early first half of 2018. So what, you've, what I've done here is looked at different trading strategies for Gilead Early, since over the last two years, since June 2018 till today. And what you see here, if I move my cursor around, is buy and hold, uh, the total uh, profit of Gilead over the last two years would have been $4.28 million for a position that started with $1 million. So about uh, uh, 428% uh, uh, profit over the last two years, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Okay, yes, okay. So that's the buy and hold return, 4.28 million. Uh, and then I've got the classic MACD. If I would have just followed an MACD rule, it would have lost me 41 million. Uh, so massively underperformed the buy and hold. And here is a strategy that I call simple moving average, which is just a crossover of the five day moving average with the 200 day moving average. Nothing fancy, nothing sophisticated, but it's something that on the index level, if you're trading FTSE or S&P 500 or NASDAQ index ETFs uh, or, or futures, that actually works quite well. For single stocks, and I still haven't found out why, it tends not to work at all. Uh, and you can see that here over the last two years, it would have created quite a bit of losses. And what I've got here is the rate of change, JK. That is the strategy that I've tried to explain a little bit with stop losses and re-entries. And if we click on that, uh, we can see, uh, if I move that up, this is the price of Gilead. And the green points are when I would have bought. And the, the red points are stop losses. And the green here, again, is a re-entry signal. And you see exactly that's what happened in the second half of uh, 2018. Uh, Gilead dropped more than 10% from its last high, uh, and I had to sell it. The stop loss was triggered on the, in early September, 5th of September 2018. Uh, it dropped some more, uh, but then recovered quickly, and I uh, bought it again uh, on a week later, basically on the 12th of September. Just to be stopped out a little bit later uh, again, uh, on the 29th, uh, 21st of September, 2018 again. Extremely frustrating if you are in this area and you'd like stop loss, okay, I go out. A week later, I buy again. A week later, oh, I'm stopped out again. It's horrible. But as you can see in this volatile sideways movement, eventually it broke down and actually I could with that second stop loss uh, prevent quite a lot of losses uh, over the, uh, over the subsequent uh, rest of the year, the subsequent quarter, because that is a, a, a move, uh, if I can just quickly annotate that. So that is a move of minus 30%, or minus 20%, sorry, uh, uh, of losses that I prevented with that stop loss here. Got back in here at this point, uh, in, in uh, early March 2019, just to be stopped out again. And you see here again, throughout 2019, the companies uh, did nothing because there wasn't any new drug coming to the market. There wasn't anything here. It was a frustrating period of 2019, stopped out re-entry, stopped out re-entry, stopped out re-entry again and again and again. And as I said, it's, it feels very frustrating, but you have to keep the discipline to stick to that rule. And eventually what it did, I didn't pre uh, predict the COVID crisis. I didn't predict that Gilead would be the one biotech company that has the most promising antiviral drug in its portfolio that could potentially help with, uh, with, with that current crisis. I didn't predict any of that, but essentially it, the, the, the share price broke out to the upside and my last buy-in was late, yeah, exactly. It was 25th of uh, November. I think I actually executed that because I was on vacation in that week uh, in early December because I remember it was kind of my Christmas present to buy into Gilead uh, late last year. Had a bit of a frustration here in the beginning as, as the, the, uh, the share price dropped a little bit. 
but have been super happy ever since. And you can see, and we all know that Gilead is one of the hottest stocks in this crisis at this point in time. And so this, this shows you that keeping that discipline of stop loss and re-entry, it can be extremely frustrating in these sideways movements, but it helps you both if the market, if the sharp share price drops down afterwards and breaks down, as well as if it breaks up because the stop loss rule will help you prevent large losses and the re-entry rule will make sure that you capture the long-term upside of the share price. And because I did that, you can see that over the last two years, this rate of change, this kind of stop loss and re-entry rule has done much better than a simple buy and hold strategy. And what we can do here as well is we can also look at uh, maximum drawdown uh, and, and things like that. Um, where do we have it? Here, uh, this, the, the buy and hold would have a maximum drawdown of 23%. The worst of this uh, rate of change strategy that I just explained uh, was a little bit less than 20%. So if you actually then show this in, sorry, if you actually show this in a scatter plot where I look on the X axis on maximum drawdown and on the Y axis on profits, you see that buy and hold is here. The trading strategy here has higher returns with lower drawdowns and the simple moving average and the MACD strategy are far out here with far bigger maximum drawdowns. And the chart here also shows you, um, if we move that up, uh, how the profitability of the different strategies work. So the light blue line that you see here is the pure buy and hold. The green one is my uh, stop loss re-entry strategy over the last two years, how the profits evolved. And then there's the MACD in dark blue and the simple moving average that in the case of, as I said, of single stocks never really works. So that's kind of how I, de I designed this entire stop loss re-entry strategy, as I said, in order to minimize regret if I sell out uh, in order to, to uh, remove some of the downside and limit drawdowns, uh, but still have the opportunity to capture the long-term uh, upside if there is a significant move up. And that's exactly what has happened with Gilead and with a lot of other stocks long sideways movement in 2019 where you don't really make money uh, and then once the, the share price starts to trend again you capture the upside just like in the buy and hold uh, instance very interesting Josie. it's so good as well that you just um, made it all so clear when you put it all together like that um, i think this is definitely something that actually a lot of our clients you know who are also share investors themselves um, should really look at because this when this analysis and these figures are not seen visually like this, I yeah. think a conventional mistake can just be made like, yeah, I can just buy and hold and that's it, it's easy. Well, you have clearly shown here and that's not the case. Um, so that was that was really insightful. And the other thing is that it's it's really good to see a resilience, you know, that you, um, on the ROC strategy, you kept re-entering it, even though you were stopped mm -hmm. about five, six times. Um, yeah. What gives you that resilience? Is it the data or is it the um, true conviction in the edge of your um, trading strategy? Um, it is literally belief, belief the system, uh, trust the system. Um, I don't know if you have a lot of uh, participants from the US, but in the US there is a team, the Philadelphia 76ers NBA basketball team. And their coach has also introduced the system. And their, their slogan over the last decade is trust the system. Mm. Uh, and trusting the system gets easier the longer you use it. And the more often you see these instances, like in the case with Gilead, where you see like, yes, keeping the discipline in place and sticking to the system will eventually help you. Um, in the beginning, the first time you do it, the, the first two, three, four times you do it, you will always feel insecure. It's like, oh, does it work? Does it not work? And you're like tempted to override the system. Um, but I have learned that's part of what I write about in the book as well. And when I was younger, 
uh, especially in the beginning of my career, I tended to override a lot of these signals because I said, look, there's a good reason why this should just be a whipsaw. And you try to second guess the system and say, oh, no, no, it, it's just a temporary setback. And you will find out that every single time you override your trading system, more often than not, you will be on the wrong side of the trade. So one of the things that I had to learn as in, in my trading portfolio, as well as when advising clients, because if, if you deal with very wealthy clients that trade on the side and you help them build a trading system like that, one of the key challenges is that every one of them will tell you, no, 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 this signal is wrong. I, I want to stay in that stock or I, wanna, I don't want to buy now because who knows uh, if, if markets will recover. Just imagine going back two months from, from today, end of March, early April, we all thought the world would going to end, was going to end. And what did we have since then? A 20% stock market rally. So uh, it just goes to show you that you have to be very disciplined and trust the system. And, and one of the things that you have to learn in applying these trading rules, whether it's this rule or any other rule, is to stick to it in a very disciplined way, not second guess it. And that in itself is a challenge for a trader as well. You know, Joseph, I absolutely um, agree with you. I think in all of the years of our, uh, research and uh, trading the markets live in front of people is that one thing keeps coming again and again in every book as well that we read is finding the system wins. And I believe that the, one of the main reasons for the system winning in the long run is, is quantified parameters. And the second is consistent execution, uh, which you have rightly um, shown over here. Consistency always wins in the end on a on a quantified set of parameters. Yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've just seen that written all over all books um, time and again. I think the last part, um, this was really good, very interesting. And I'm sure some of the audience here will go and revisit this material too. Um, and, and just a reiteration, guys, is that the book that Josim has, has, has written, it's uh, very insightful, highly recommend for everyone to read it. I'm gonna send you all the link for it shortly as well. And uh, the good news is that Harriman Publishing has given a discount code as well for the book. So I'll send that to you all on the chat box very soon. Before we get to that part, just I'm gonna open up the, um, the, the Q&A section to the audience. So if you all got any questions at all, just type it in. And as I'm getting some of them true, maybe I can start it off. Um, a couple of things Josie, I wanted to ask you was mainly on the, in the oil sector. So um, what, what's your views on the oil sector? That's one. And also the second thing, which is of course, which is a continuous hot topic always is in terms of technology is the blockchain technology. Yeah. So what are your views on these two parts? One is the oil sector and the second one is the blockchain tech stocks. What, what do you think about them too? Have you analyzed any of them? Yes, uh, but more from a fundamental perspective. Uh, and in the oil sector, um, it is an interesting observation with, obviously we've had, I mean, just when you think you, you've seen it all, oil prices go negative, which is something that nobody has ever had. Uh, in, in his books, I would say, um, or in ex expectations. So uh, the question is, will we see a sustained recovery in oil prices? And, and here we can learn a lesson from history because uh, what triggered that oil price decline obviously was the dispute between Saudi Arabia and Russia about uh, cutting uh, production quotas. And when Russia said, no, we won't cut, Saudi Arabia swamped uh, the market with excess supply. Now, this has happened before. In 1985, a lot of OPEC countries didn't want to cut supply. And so what Saudi Arabia did was to actually produce enormous amounts of oil and sent the oil price lower, dramatically lower in 1985, in order to, to discipline the other uh, producers. Uh, and Saudi Arabia has the advantage of not only having the largest oil reserves or amongst the largest oil reserves, but also having about the lowest production costs of all oil producers in the world. So they can survive with low oil prices for a very long time. And here comes the interesting thing. Saudi Arabia produces a barrel of oil at roughly 10 to $12 per barrel. So as long as the price for oil is above 
10 to 12 dollars saudi arabia is making money Oh, Russia, okay. on the other hand, produces, people estimate, at roughly 30 to $40 per barrel. Oh, so what Saudi Arabia needs to make sure is that uh, basically all the oil price stays somewhere between 10 and 30 or $40 per barrel. That's when Russia will bleed and Saudi Arabia will still make money. And that's what I expect to happen, that oil prices will likely be range bound in that 10 to $40 uh, range Interesting. because that is what will discipline Russia. And Saudi Arabia can play that game for a very long time until Russia basically has to back off and say, okay, we're going back to OPEC plus. We're coordinating with you again in our production quarters. Nice side effect. U.S. shale gas and shale oil producers also produce at around $30 to $40 uh, minimum. So uh, while Saudi Arabia is targeting Russia, it effectively also hits or hurts the competition from U.S. shale oil producers. So it's a double win for Saudi Arabia. So what I would expect in that sector is, as I said, a couple of years of range-bound trading. Whenever we go above 30, close to 40, like we are now, uh, I would short the oil price, and whenever we go towards 15, 10, uh, 15 or ten dollars per per uh, barrel, I would start to go long again. That's the oil sector. Blockchain, I would say, I have two a two part answer. Uh, I am a big fan of blockchain technology. I think it is a technology that can revolutionize a lot of areas in commerce. Uh, with smart contracts, for example, it's particularly valuable when it comes to international export and import um, because you can automatize and, and kind of create smart contracts for exports, etc. And I'm super optimistic about these applications. Uh, where I'm highly doubtful is everything that is cryptocurrency related. Uh, I don't think that cryptocurrencies will become a major force in the currency market. I don't think they will in any near future replace fiat currencies or other traditional currencies as main currencies. How, uh, so in that respect, I think they're mostly for traders and, and for short-term investment purposes um, as, a, as a kind of way to make money. Um, but I also think that this entire blockchain technology will increasingly also be adopted by central banks. And the Central Bank of Sweden, for example, is running an experiment since February 2019 of creating a digital currency in Sweden. Um, so, uh, oh, actually, since February this year uh, of creating a digital currency in Sweden. So, I think it will, the blockchain technology will be more and more adopted also by central banks to create digital payment systems and digital currencies that are issued by central banks. But I don't think that any of the major cryptocurrencies that we know of today will replace traditional currencies. Interesting. In, in terms of the um, blockchain technology, in fact, I must say I'm. I feel there's a stronger case for the technology to sustain rather than the currency itself. But time will tell. Uh, so in terms of the technology itself, and I've studied a little bit into it, it's very robust, uh, smart contracts and all that, and it looking after to replace the current technology in healthcare, military, and all of that. So are there any stocks that you are looking into in the blockchain technology sector? I haven't, to be honest, no. I, so I can't really say anything there in terms of which which ones I would do, uh, which I, which ones I would look for or not. Uh, where I'm more interested in is digital payment systems. So I like stocks like Wirecard, uh, right. the German kind of credit card payment systems provider. Um, that is that is an interesting. Okay. Sorry, that is an interesting uh, a stock that I like to look at. Good. Um, just got a few questions coming in from the audience. So I'll just. Uh, so I think one of the first ones, I think you did mention this a little bit. Maybe you can brush through it. So Mohan is asking, why five stocks in a portfolio, not 10 or 20, etc.? cetera? Um, it is just a matter of. I do trading, I'm not a daily, I don't look at my portfolio daily and I don't focus a lot of it. I do it next uh, to my day job. 
and I do it for other clients. And so five stocks is something that I can handle uh, as a hobby on the side. Um, there is no rule whether it should be five, 10, 20, et cetera. I've had clients who had portfolios of 20 and 30 stocks that they were trading, uh, where I helped them with that. I had other clients that restricted themselves to two or three. So there's no hard and fast rule. It depends on how much you feel comfortable with and how much time you can spend on monitoring them and, and analyzing them. Okay. And then the other one is, um, so I think this is actually written in the book, but I'll just uh, read it out to you, which is after a stop loss has been hit, um, do you only buy at a lower price than you sold or also at higher? Also higher. Doesn't matter. The if the rule triggers at a higher price than where it actually, where it origin where the stop loss originally triggered, I buy at a higher price. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I saw in the book as well. Um, another one is coming is what PE, what, price earning ratio do you consider good for buying shares? <laughs> <laughs> Low enough so you make money. Um, <laughs> uh, I think you cannot give a, a hard number. Uh, mm -hmm. So Ben Graham originally said below 10 would be a good number. Um, it's hard to find a, a PE below 10 these days. Um, well, now in the crisis, yes, but otherwise not. Um, so that's why, I, as, I, as I said in the beginning, uh, I do a ranking. I, I look at the PE ratio of the stock and compare it to all the other stocks in the index or in the market. And if it's in the top third, I consider it an attractive uh, a stock. So if it's amongst the one third lowest PE ratios in the market, I consider it attractive. And for some markets that might be 15 and other markets, it might be 20. And in, again, other markets, it might be seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think a few others are good. Just looking at time, just got to pick out some other questions. Um, I think the simple one, I think when I'm reading it, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's no one answer to this. I mean, the, the question is, is FTSE now on the on, onward trend or is it still going up and down? Uh, at the moment, I would say for the next two, three months, uh, I would expect it to be trending higher with uh, the occasional setback whenever we get some bad news from potentially a re uh, re the, the crisis flaming up again and more infections coming in after we open up. Um, but I would say if you invest in the FTSE today, uh, you're going to be fine at the end of the year. I think the FTSE is going to be higher than where it is today. Mm, okay. I think the other question is the same thing again on volatility. I would suggest that uh, uh, you guys read the book on that, on the specifics. Um, how often do you monitor share price for re-entry or is it an automated process? Um, the stop losses are automated. Uh, so I, whenever I buy a, sh a stock, I, I automatically put a, a stop loss into my e-banking uh, system. The re-entry is monitored on a weekly basis. I just quickly check every Monday uh, where are we with the, with the five stocks or the six stocks that, that, that I have. Um, takes me five minutes. And if a, if a re-entry signal has been triggered, then I just quickly buy them. Great. And I think the one last question I'm getting is, is there a case to be made for small and micro caps being more reactive, flexible, business sustainable long term, although their debt levels are usually and suffer from higher volatility? Yeah, the problem with small caps and micro caps is the liquidity issue that you have sometimes very, very strange price jumps if the, market, mm. if the stock is very illiquid. Uh, and so that can mess up your, your stop loss and re-entry completely. Um, because you, 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 your share price might just drop through the stop loss without you being able to execute the, the stop loss um, because it's just there's just no market there, no, no, no turnover. Um, so it's, it's very tricky. Uh, I typically don't go into the, the smallest stocks. Um, I typically want to have roughly uh, 500,000 to 1 million daily turnover on average, which typically means that you restrict yourself to something like a 50 million market cap and more. Okay, um, great. I think that will conclude that. Just a quick thing on, in terms of where to get your book, um, Seven Mistakes Every Investor Makes. So let me just put in the link, um, guys, over here on the chat box. I believe all of you can see that at the moment. Highly recommend it. And that's how I got to know about Joe Sim too. Really good insight for reading more on 
how you can re-enter, the placing the stops, all that is written inside the book, a great research papers that were referenced as well. I found a lot of things really very, very um, useful over there and very different. In terms of the discount code, Harriman Publishing has nicely and uh, kindly offered all our members here today who have attended uh, Trader Stock with a discount code. Uh, that's Mystics 30. So let me just share my screen very quickly, guys. So this is the page you can go on to. And if you add to Basket, um, then you can put in your discount code at a particular point, I believe, over here. View Basket over here. And I think you can put your discount code at some particular point that you can see. I think you can go to uh, checkout and then it Yeah, that's out. right. And I think you can you can do it there. So I've given you all the discount code um, for that one. Um, the other thing is, I know some of you have been asking, so where can you all find out more about uh, Josim? I think, Josim, you've given me this thing, Clement on investing.substack.com. Is that right? Absolutely. That's my blog, free for everybody. I publish a post every day, Monday to Friday. And it is my exercise in what I mentioned at the beginning of this trader's talk, namely reading wide and far. So it, it tackles a lot of topics, uh, not just market related, but it can be about history, it can be all, all kinds of things. But I always bring it back to either economics or investments. Nice. Let me just post that link out there to the guys. Okay, great. So I think everyone should find that um, there too. And also, um, I've also written a small excerpt on our website too, on the book um, as well. I don't know if you've seen it as well, Josim, the three points which I really found very, very interesting, uh, which is the right balance between short-term and long-term orientation, which you've already covered here trailing profit earning ratios. And the last one I really found really very good was the that small boutique funds actually with the fund managers having their active shares in it actually performed much better. So um, all those things can be all read much more further in detail inside Joseph's uh, book, Seven Mystics Every Investor Makes. So you can get that on there. Any last things you want to add, Joseph, for the... Um, no, I, I, I had a lot of fun explaining this. I hope uh, people enjoyed it and learned something from it and uh, hope to kind of see and hear from you on my blog uh, or in future Trader Stock. Great stuff. And the last thing I just want to say, also thanks to all our sponsors who have um, you know, promoted this further, especially to IT contractors as well. They have great um, CV track uh, um, application that they do. So you can check them out, IT contractors as well. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. Thanks so much, Josim, for spending your time coming here, explaining everything. It was so good, so interesting, so insightful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.